All right. Good morning again. I am Brett Terry. I'm one of your pastors here at Bethel. Glad you're with us this morning. We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 14 this morning. Luke 14, verses 7 through 14. Uh, If you have an electronic device, phone, tablet, we encourage you to use those. And and if you want to do an Instagram or a tweet or whatever the thing is today, you be be free to do that and let folks that know that you're here worshiping God this morning. Um, We're going to be using the ESV. That's what I'll be reading from, uh, at least initially here. The the passage. So if you have your device, you can queue up ESV if you want to read the same thing I'm, I'm reading. Um, if you don't have your own Bible or you don't have a device this morning, you should find a, a Bible under your seat or somewhere near you. And please use that. We'll be on page 873 in those Bibles. And if you do not have a Bible for any reason, please take that with you. That's what they're there for. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. We feel it's very important. I want to do just a little bit of um, backup because, again, we're, we're coming into a parable, uh, and so we want to get the context. Uh, last week, we looked at, um, in the first few verses of this, this chapter 14 here, Jesus is eating at a Pharisee's home. And as Andy pointed out last week, his very presence there is revealing God's grace and love because these guys really, for the most part, don't like him. Some of them are probably involved in the plot to kill him because they don't like him. And they've, it looks like they've possibly planted a guy there that's sick. He's invited over on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus takes the bait, <laughs> which is what they were hoping he would do. But he does it in a way that's disappointing to them. For their, it frustrates their plans because he asks them, is it, is it lawful to heal someone on the Sabbath? And he wants to provoke their thinking. He wants to reveal again God's grace is about loving people. God does things that we can't imagine. He acts in ways that we don't anticipate. And so he asks this very pointed question, and he backs it up with very pointed actions because he heals the man. And so the guys there that are his adversaries, his enemies, they're trying to trick him, plotting to trip him up. They're disappointed, and they can't answer. They don't have any good answer for him. So that's where we come into this chapter 14, verse 7 through 14, because then Jesus, in response to what's going on there, he does what we're going to read about. So follow along with me if you would. I'm going to read out loud. You can follow along silently. It says, now he, Jesus, verse 7, told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose places of honor, saying to them, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you'll begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So, Jesus tells another parable. He tells a story, and I want to remind us, a parable is a story... It's not real circumstances, but it's a story that's similar to real circumstances, and it makes a point, usually in response to the context, what's going on. Almost every time Jesus does this, that's what it is. He's responding to what he's seen, what he's observing going on, or things that have been said or asked. And the context here is at this this feast, it's really, it's for us to put it in our terms so that we can visualize it, it's Sunday dinner. An important person has invited a bunch of his friends and this guy Jesus, this traveling rabbi who's made quite a reputation for himself, they don't really like him because he seems to not be totally on board with them and doing the things they expected of him. And so throws an elaborate dinner on the Sabbath. And I don't know exactly how a feast is pulled off on the Sabbath for the Jews because they weren't supposed to work. (laughs) So somehow they got this ready. And Jesus comes and he sees people because this is a bunch of important people, people are trying to jockey for position. And very common in those days, um, 
when you had a feast, they'd want to, you know, there's certain positions that are the guests of honor, the important people, have the good tables, the get served first, that kind of thing. And so he sees people trying to maneuver themselves into those places, not being uh, sat down there and seated there and, you know, escorted in, but just trying to move into those places. So he tells this story. And it's, he uses uh, something that's even a bigger deal than this Sabbath dinner, a wedding feast. And for us, we don't, you know, I could tell you all the history about Jewish wedding feast and you'd all sit there looking at me pretty much like you're doing right now. <laughs> like, okay, great. <laughs> so I thought I'd put it in context for us just a little bit. We, one of our daughters um, got married last October and um, she's quite a, a planner. She loves parties and all that kind of stuff. So she had this just, it was an awesome event for our family and, and for all their friends and, and relatives that were invited. And so we've got a few pictures. We'll get them up there. A lot of work went into this thing. It was very well done. Every table, we spent a day and a half decorating. It was in Omaha at a, a venue, kind of a cool urban uh, industrial vibe going on at the place. And each table had its own unique decorations. There was books, there was pictures of the couple, flower arrangements. Each one was done differently. And there was a whole room full. It was quite quite big. Um, it featured them and, and almost every one of the books she'd rented all this vintage stuff from somebody. I don't know where she found it, but most of the books had wedding or engagement or, uh, you know, courtship themes to the titles. It just very well done. And then a banquet was prepared and um, they had uh, soup, salad, sandwiches, beverages. It was a Saturday uh, late afternoon wedding. So they just you can't see the food, but you can get the idea how big the, the spread was there. And they had their own special cake um, just for them, a small cake for them, the, the flavors that they liked. Um, for the kids and, and for the adults too, they had a, a whole uh, buffet of, uh, well, those are truffles. One of our other daughters made all these handmade truffles. Oh, they were delicious. <laughs> Sorry, there's none left. But um, <clears throat> And then they had this whole buffet laid out of of candy and little bags and scoops so everybody could get favors. And, of course, the kids were going nuts, you know, <laughs> looking at that stuff there. Um, they had a, a slide. We did a slideshow up at the beginning of the reception after the wedding ceremony. Um, there was a kid's corner that had coloring books and games so kids could have something to do during the reception. There was a place of honor for the um, bride and groom in the wedding party. Uh, we, I think we have a photo of that maybe too. Or there we go. There they are. That's our daughter on the on your uh, right, and her husband, and one of the guys making a, a toast there, a speech about them. But they were in the place of honor up front. They had a big chandelier over the top of them, another vintage thing. And um, there was reserved tables for the families. There was reserved tables for some of their guests. Of course, the bridal party had their own special table up front. So it was very elaborate, very well done. And there was a lot of assigned seating. But the thing was, and they even had gifts for some of the people they wanted to honor, and they invited a whole bunch of people. But the thing was, we were there to celebrate them and their joy. And I think there's maybe one more picture. This one's in there just for no apparent reason. That's just our family. <laughs> the guests with all the grandkids and kids. And so um, it, it was just awesome. It was a long event. I mean, the ceremony wasn't super long, but we had the dinner and they had a dance afterwards and just a lot of time hanging out. But we were there to honor them, to celebrate with them, to share their joy. That's what a wedding feast is about. And so even though this wasn't a Jewish wedding feast, you get the similar idea, an elaborate banquet plan. There's going to be places of honor throughout the, the reception and it's going to be an awesome time. But we had three choices, the people that attended this event for our daughter, their wedding. We had three choices. One, we could accept our seating assignment and celebrate with them. Now, because we were the parents of the bride, we were quite happy with our seating assignment. <laughs> but there were tables. We couldn't go sit up at the front with the bridegroom and the wedding party because we weren't in the wedding party. So we still had an assigned seat. But the number one choice was we could accept our seating assignment and celebrate with them. The number two thing was we could try to manipulate and get into a, a different seat than where we were and face possible embarrassment. And, and we actually had that happen. 
Had people, oh, no, you can't sit there. You have to move. This is, this is reserved for this part of the family or somebody. And then the third choice was to lament our placement and miss the celebration. We had some people do that too. Now, we minimized it. We tried to keep that from the bride and groom as much as possible. But there were some people that came and was like, we're sitting here. How come we can't sit here? <laughs> and uh, some of that I had to deal with, and I just had to walk up and politely tell them, well, because you're not special. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But those were the choices. We could accept our seating assignment, celebrate. We could try to manipulate and get into a better place and face possible embarrassment and having to move. Or we could sit there and moan about where we were and, and just miss out on the, not, not even do what we were there to do, miss the celebration altogether. And in life, even within our own church family here at Bethel, we have those same choices. I don't mean this morning <laughs> where you're sitting. I want to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18. This is a different analogy. The Bible uses several, several metaphors or illustrations that, that give this principle. But this is what it says. This 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18 from the ESV. I think we'll have that up on screen as well. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, and here's the discontent thing coming in, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arrange the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Now back to the wedding feast picture illustration. God is the master planner of the feast. He places us where he chooses, just like what we read in Corinthians here, in a body illustration, he puts us where he wants us to. He's the planner. He's the one who's organizing and determining that. So the question I want to explore this morning as we look at this parable that Jesus told is, are you content where he has placed you? Are you enjoying the celebration? <laughs> Some people think Christianity following Jesus is supposed to be a somber uh, kind of a death march, you know, just slog and get through it, singing the, um, the guard song from the Wizard of Oz, you know, ooh, oh, wee, oh, you know, just, ugh. And the other people come in and they go, oh, I don't want that. <laughs> But when we read the Bible and we look at Jesus' life, he was, yes, there's difficult times, there's times of sadness, but also he's very much about celebration and enjoying the life that God has given us. So, are you content with where God has placed you? Are you enjoying the celebration? Are you honoring him and sharing his joy? Or do you have some other things going on? I want to read this again, this body illustration. It takes a slightly different perspective. Romans 12, 4 through 10. I'm going to read it this time out of the New Living Translation. It says, Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We have many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring who? Each other. Each other. This is a recurring theme. This, that last line there, take delight in honoring each other, is a recurring theme in Scripture. Guys will flash some verses up here fairly quickly. I think Luke 6, 31, Jesus speaking, he says, As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Jesus again speaking, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. You shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. Ephesians 5.28, instruction within a marriage. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Now, our culture says it's good to do good things to other people. It's good for husbands to treat their wives the right way as long as it gets you ahead, gets you what you want. That's a good strategy. That, go for that. If that works for you, go for that. And we're bombarded with that. But God's culture is very different. His, his perspective, His way of operating is very different. Proverbs 25, 27, this is an interesting proverb. It said, it's not good to eat much honey, nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. I like ice cream. If you know me well, you know that. And uh, several years ago, I got diagnosed with borderline diabetes. And my wife changed my diet. <laughs> I started getting exercise, dropped a bunch of weight, didn't have to take any medicine. I still like ice cream. But I've also realized that a serving size is not a container. <laughs> it's what it used to be. <laughs> so I can have a little bit, I can enjoy it. I can enjoy a little ice cream. And, and God says the same thing with honey. Honey is good. But when you eat a whole jar at once, it's going to cause problems. He says, just like it's not good to eat much honey, it's not glorious to seek one's own, it's not glorious to seek one's own glory. Another proverb says this, Proverbs 27, 2. Let another praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Does that sound like the culture you live in? Wait for somebody else to praise you. Don't, don't toot your own horn. Uh, I just uh, continually get tickled from pro sports down to high school level. And when they interview on the news players, uh, you'll almost always hear some variation like this. Well, we're pretty awesome. And we're going to go in there and beat the other team because, you know what, we're just the best. That's all there is to it. And if they, if they lose, they go, well, we're pretty awesome, but we didn't have all of our awesome pills today, and, you know, we're going to take them again next week, and then we'll be wiping everybody up. Our culture is very much about self-promotion, um, just looking out for yourself and telling everybody how great you are. Um, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think about that. I want to read it once more. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then 1 Peter 5, 6 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. I, wanna, I want you to think on those two passages with me, because this is what happens in our culture. We take those verses, those passages, what God says, and we think it's a positioning strategy. Well, if I want to be first, I have to pay my dues. I got I to gotta put myself in the lower place, humble myself, and at, if I do that well enough, then God's going to get me back into first place. That's not what it's saying. Not at all. It's saying God defines greatness as serving. In God's economy, in God's culture, in God's kingdom, He says, you know who the greatest is? The one that serves. And the one that serves everybody is a slave of everybody. He is the greatest. It, it doesn't say when he does that long enough, he'll be placed in the greatest position. Are you with me? Shake your head if you kind of get. <laughs> he, he doesn't say, hey, th if you do this, this is a good strategy to manipulate and work your way into first place. He says, no, I define greatness as serving. That is radically different from what I'm hearing in my culture. How about you? And he says the reward, and we've seen this in other, other studies here in the last few months in, in Luke as Jesus is teaching, the reward for doing what God wants us to do, to serving, to being content with where he's placed us, to just honoring him and sharing in his joy and celebrating with him, the reward is the joy of more participation with him. And that's, that's radically different than our culture too. See, in our culture, if you're not careful, you, you'll have a 
undercurrent of this and you're thinking, go, well, that's a great for church on Sunday and, you know, when we're doing a Bible study. It's like, but my reward, if I do well at my job, I, I don't want more responsibility. I want retirement. <laughs> I want to get off and do what I want to do. I'm, I'm just slogging through this for so many years so I can get to the place where I can do what I want. This isn't, this isn't joy for me. And yeah, work is part of the curse <laughs> as, as we know it, so there's difficult stuff in it. But Jesus and God identify serving as the greatest place, and the reward is more participation. See, some of us, because we look at our, our, what our culture says about what the reward is, if you work hard all your life, then you get to sit around and do nothing, and that's why we think eternity is going to be so boring. Like, oh boy, endless time of sitting on a cloud eating marshmallows and playing harps? Whew. Well, the air conditioning's good, but that, you know, no, it's a wrong concept. That's not what Scripture tells us eternity is going to be like. But we identify with what we're familiar with, and we run it through our own grid. So, Jesus speaks again, Luke 17, 10, and He says this, When you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. If you, at work, if you do what your boss tells you, he gives you a to-do list, and you do what you're supposed to do, at the end of the day, does your boss walk in and go, wow, you are so awesome. I can't believe you did what you were actually told. Well, if he does, that's unfortunate reflection of our culture, (laughs) because fewer and fewer people are doing that. Normally, no. And when your boss hands you your paycheck, do they, they come up, make a big deal, throw a party? <whistles> wow, you worked this week. Great, here you go. Not normally, right? You're just, isn't that what you're supposed to do at work? You do your work, <laughs> then you get paid. The boss says, here you go. See you next week. It's okay for the boss to praise me, but it's not okay for me to think it's a right and demand him to praise me. And we have a lot of that going on in our culture. You see how far off we are from scriptural principle? Why it's so tough to grasp these principles? Live them out? Well, my boss didn't tell me I was awesome today. I don't know if I want to work here anymore. <laughs> well, that's not really what he needs to do. It's okay if he wants to do that, but that's not a right that you and I have. So Jesus tells us not to try and position ourselves in a place of honor. And one way we try to do that is by working our way in, in the picture of the wedding feast, by going and sitting in a place that we, we shouldn't be in, or d- deciding, I, I deserve to sit here. He says, no, nah, don't do that. Don't try to honor yourself in that way. Then there's another way that we can try to do this, and that's when he turns around and talks to this other guy. Let me read those verses 12 to 14 again in Luke 14. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Is Jesus telling us when he talks to this guy and by default speaking to us as well, is he saying, we can't have our friends over for dinner? Is that what he's telling us? I don't think so. Why? Well, because of other places in Scripture, what it speaks of. We're not going to look these up, or at least not on screen, but 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, 8, it talks about church leaders are to be hospitable. Their home is to be open, inviting others in for a meal. 1 Peter 4, 9 says that we're to be hospitable with each other, and it's, it's talking to believers, followers of Jesus. So, Let's not forget the context. Context is important. What's the point of this story that Jesus has just told? Don't try working your way into a place of honor. One way is trying to manipulate and get yourself into that place. Another way that we do it, and this is much more subtle, is through mutual admiration societies. I get people, hey, listen, if I pat you on the back, then you should pat me on the back. And so we have all all kinds of uh, websites, oftentimes Facebook is that, you know. I can, I can post a picture on there. I can look as ratty as can be, and people go, oh, awesome pic, you know. <laughs> look, did you look at it? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And we, we do that constantly. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, listen, if you want to serve, don't just do nice stuff for people that you think are going, you're going to get some benefit out of it. It's going to be another way to honor yourself, that they're going to pay you back, whether materially or just with praise and honor. And think about our society and what we do. Typically, and I just want to point this out so you can compare it. Typically, when somebody has a fundraising banquet, what do they do for the donors? We praise them, right? We'll have speakers come in and tell them what awesome people they are and how they can feel so good about themselves and others will respect them and praise them because they're giving to this worthy cause. And we, we don't hear a lot of fundraising speeches like this. Hey, you know this is a good thing, so why don't you get on board? And then the guy goes and sits down, do you? You don't hear that. We spend a lot of time kind of working it up. It's like, listen, you do this good thing for us, we'll put your name on a plaque or post it in the paper or do something like that. Mutual admiration. And so what becomes the motivation for giving? Many times, not every time, but many times then, it's because I'm going to get something back out of this. That's what Jesus is talking about with this guy. He's got a bunch of his friends that all think the same way as he does there at this feast. Uh, Luke 6, 31 through 36, we looked at this several months ago, but uh, Jesus is speaking, and I want to read it to you again. He says, as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. <laughs> and if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? And of course, obviously, you go, well, if I lend money and I get it back, then that would be a good thing. He says, we're talking about eternity here, not right this short bit of life we have here on earth. Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the, who? Ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Wow, that's tough, isn't it? How, how kind is God to you and I? Says he's, well, He's kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Do you know who that's defining there? Not just the person sitting next to you. It's you and I. God's that kind. And, of course, as Andy pointed out last week, that's what we see Jesus going to this dinner for in the first place, to show God's kindness, even to those that hate Him. He says, you want to you wanna build up something for eternity? This is what you do. And, of course, we see that Romans 5.8. God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We have a tough time with that concept, don't we? That's not where we're naturally bent. That's why so many times a church seems to have an emphasis, I'm just talking about church in general here, on giving the impression to people that you need to clean your life up so you can come and join us. Because we've forgotten what God has done for us, and it's hard for us to grasp that. And by the way, when God does this, He showed His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That wasn't an afterthought. That wasn't a reaction. He didn't say, oh, these guys messed it up. Now what am I going to do? Because listen to this, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You see? It wasn't a reaction. It wasn't an afterthought. It was something that he chose and planned in advance, and he did it because it delighted him, not because it was an obligation or something he had to do. So how do we live this out now, what Jesus has just, these few words that Jesus has spoken? 
Don't try to place yourself in positions of honor. And don't try to get yourself honor by developing a mutual admiration society around you of people that will say nice things about you if you say nice things about them. Well, some questions I think you and I need to ask ourselves. Are you busy trying to get yourself in a place of honor? Many people are. It's very culturally acceptable. You'll even be applauded for that. It's the, the natural bent of our own selfish nature and the influence of our culture to seek that out. Are you using your relationships with others to get honor in whatever form you define honor? Ask yourself this, what is the motive of your generosity if you are generous? <laughs> One, you need to ask, am I generous? Two, what's the motive of my generosity? Is it duty? And I've heard, growing up, I grew up in church, and I've heard plenty of, of messages that kind of had this as the bottom line. You better give God what He deserves because if you don't, He'll take it from you anyway. So, if you're a thinking person and you believe the Bible, you go, well, I better give it to Him because He's going to get it anyway. So, kind of a duty thing. Self-interest, getting something back, is that the motive for your generosity? We have guys preaching that today. It's gone on for ages, but it's going on today. You, you, give, you give this to God and then He'll give back tenfold or a hundredfold to you. Uh, almost always, you can kind of tell it's going that way because usually where you should give to God is through their ministry. You, know, you plant a seed here and we'll, it'll double. Not from us, but you know, God will take care of it for you. Or is it superiority? You know the reason I give to others, why I'm generous? It's because I'm better than you. A lot of people think that way too. I'm just, I'm just awesome, so that's why I do it. And the reason you don't is you're not. And I, I've struggled with this myself. Uh, I, I, I debated whether to share this with you, but my wife and I have been in ministry for over 30 years, and um, a lot of that time, not here, not the last church I pastored here in North Platte, but many places... Previous to that, we were poorly paid or poorly supported. Uh, we had a large family, and often we didn't have a whole lot financially coming in. And um, there was times when it was kind of tough financially. Now, we never went hungry or did without what we really needed, but there was times it was quite tough. And I went through a, a, a time several years, actually, where I was kind of reasoning, you know, my whole life is giving to serving God. And I can't afford to give God 10% or anything regularly because our income is so sporadic and, and we have all these kids to take care of and, and needs that need to be met. But I had a nagging feeling it wasn't right, so sometimes we'd give and it would be out of duty. Sometimes it's like, well, I'm better than other people because I'm serving God full time and I'm not getting much back in return, so that's my offering to God is, is my life. But the thing was, in all that, so there, there was all these things I just mentioned. Duty, yes. <laughs> Self-interest, getting something back, yes. Superiority, yes. But there was no joy involved. And then 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which we won't have on screen, but if you want to write it down, I don't think it's in your notes either. It says this, Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> I thought, oh boy. So I'm supposed to do it because I really want to. Be cheerful about it. God says, yeah. So that rules out duty. It's really based on my heart response to God, what I'm going to give to Him. And uh, I thought I was better than other people because of how I was living my life. And that's common. You go, I didn't, I didn't think a, a pastor or a minister would struggle with that. Really? You need to wake up. It's common. I've talked to a lot of guys in ministry. It's common. And then as I thought about this giving because of what I've decided in my heart and God loves a cheerful giver, I thought, hmm, as God continued to show me the truth of this, I found out my heart wasn't very generous. And you know why? Because I wasn't really very focused on how generous and gracious God had been with me. I was more concerned about getting myself in what I had defined as a place of honor. 
when I started focusing on how gracious God has been with me, he's kind of the ungrateful and the evil, and that's me. That changed my perspective about the stuff that I have and, and how I can honor God and share his joy and celebrate with him. Now, have I reached the pinnacle yet? Have I finally become better than you? <laughs> no. Well, that's not the point. But see, the focus is changed off of myself and where I am and who God is and what He's done for me. So instead of it, you're, if you're generous, if you are generous at all, and you can ask yourself that and evaluate, instead of the motive being duty, self-interest, getting something back, superiority, here's what our motivating thing should be. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15. I believe we can get that up on screen too for you to see it. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, and that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Instead of seeking my honor, it's his honor that I want to look for. Instead of worried about where my seat is, I'm there to enjoy the celebration with him, share his joy. Do the work that he has for me. Function in the place that he's put me in his body. Be the part of the building he wants me to be. Be the flower, the plant, whatever, in his garden where he's the master gardener, allowing him to do what he does. So, I want to close with this. Are you a follower of Jesus? Trusted him as your Savior? By the way, those things are the same in the Bible. Um, we've unfortunately in many cases broken those apart. Like, I trust Jesus as my Savior so that the penalty of my sin is taken care of, and then at some point I may decide to follow him. Jesus says, no, that's all one package. Now, you may be a poor follower, you may be dragging your feet, but you're by definition, when you trust me as your Savior, I also become your Lord, your Master, and so I want you to follow me. And if you have really trusted me as your Savior, I am going to be working to conform you to the image of my son. And, and God's not waiting for you and I to say, well, let me think on that and I'll get back with you if I want to participate. He's going to do that because that's what he said. And he's God, and so he's going to accomplish what he set out to do. Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you trusted him as your savior? Then ask yourself this. I have to ask myself the same thing. In, is his life in you becoming more visible to you is the life of Jesus in me becoming more visible to me? I can fool you. You can fool me, correct? We don't spend that much time together. I can't fool my wife as much, but you I can fool. You can fool me. We see each other. We wave at each other in Walmart. But am I seeing a difference in my life, in my perspective, because the life of Jesus is in me? Now, he doesn't... He doesn't save us from the penalty of sin because our life looks better. But if, there's, if he's given me new life, do you think that's going to come out some? Scripture would indicate it would. Do you see any difference? Ask yourself that. How will you respond to what God is speaking to you this morning? Whatever that is. Is, is Jesus' life more visible to you in you? And is it more visible to others around you? Well, when you give people permission to evaluate your life and you're honest about it and they, and they figure that out, you'll hear some surprising things probably. And then for those that might be here that have never accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord and ruler of their life, I want to ask you these things. Wouldn't you like to know that you're right with God? Wouldn't you like to know your sin is forgiven? Wouldn't you like to have the joy of working with God in something that has worth and value and will last for eternity? You can. The invitation's open for you to have a place at the table. There's a place in His body for you, but you have to make that decision. If you have questions about that, ask. I'd be glad to talk to you. There's quite a few other people here that could show you what God's Word says. Matter of fact, as we finish this morning up in this corner, to my left, your right, there'll be some of our elders here, church leaders, that will be glad to pray with you about that or anything that you want someone to pray with you, come up and take advantage of them after we dismiss if you'd like to.
As I look at what Jesus says, I realize I have to think radically different than the culture around me if I'm a follower of Jesus. And we all do. It's not something that comes naturally. But what will you do, what will I do with what Jesus has said to us this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Not only do we have it in our language, but we have it in multiple versions, translations, so that we can understand what you have to say to us. We thank you that we're not reliant on our own intelligence or ability to read, but you use your spirit, you use messengers, you use a, a variety of things to communicate your word to us and, and allow us to understand it so that we can know the truth, so that we can know who you are. And yet, who you are is so different, so other than everything we see around us that sometimes it's difficult for us to grasp and sometimes we, we just in, reinterpret what your word says without even realizing it. So help us uh, again this morning. We know you're going to do your work, but that we would respond to what you're teaching us. If there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that they would understand their need, that they can't sneak into the feast, uh, they'll have to be removed if that's the case. And that'll be embarrassing for them and everyone around them. But you have a place for us. You invite us in to celebrate and give us life and to share in your joy. For those of us that are followers of Jesus, that we would not just listen to this as pleasant words, but that we would look to you, how do we implement that in our life this week? And so we're asking you for that and trusting you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.